You're listening to Stand Out Get Noticed, episode 248. Hi there, Rockstar, and welcome to Stand Out Get Noticed. I'm your host, Christina Cantors. I'm a speaker, coach, and the founder of The C Method, where I help high-performing professionals to build powerful communication skills. I'm really excited to let you know that doors to my monthly members-only accountability and training program, The C Method Academy, open next week. So one week from now, on the 19th of February, doors will open for a very, very limited time. The Academy is for people who want to develop their communication skills, build their leadership, heighten their visibility, and to learn new skills in a supportive environment. We already have a thriving community in there and I open up the doors only a few times a year. So if taking your communication and your leadership to the next level is something that you are committed to doing this year, then make sure you jump on the wait list. Go to thecmethod.com slash join. That's thecmethod.com slash join to jump on the wait list for the Academy and you'll receive notification of when it opens up first, as well as receive an early bird discount. All right, let's get into this week's episode. And I am really excited to be exploring a topic that we don't normally talk about. And it's all about the struggles, the failures, the dejection and rejection that are all part of the journey of creating success. Now, we do have a more business focus in this episode, but the principles that you're about to learn will also apply to, you know, if you're building up your career as well. You know, we we see, we tend to see a lot of overnight success, and I use air quotes when I say that, and, you know, especially with social media, we only see the, the finished product. I mean, it's the same with this podcast. You're hearing the finished product, but you're not seeing all the work or the struggles or the effort that went into creating this this uh, podcast, the finished product. So we tend to look at businesses, we look at people who are successful and go, oh, wow, that, that just happened overnight. They just exploded overnight. How did that happen? And what we don't see is the journey to get there. And as Richard Branson said, he said, there are no quick wins in business. It takes years to become an overnight success. So today we're going to dive into essentially that the hard slog and I'm really excited to introduce my guest Jason Sultan who is the co-founder and design director of Soul and Wolf which is a digital marketing agency based here in Melbourne. He's also the founder of an upcoming conference which is super cool it's called No BS and he created this conference out of frustration from attending too many conferences with weak and uninspiring content with a little relevance. And he decided, you know what, I'm going to create an event that where the content is real and where the speakers share, you know, their real struggles, their real stories, which is super cool. And that's coming up in March. I also happen to be emceeing this conference. So if you come along, please do come and say hi. So I sat down with Jason and I said, you know what, I want to hear about not so much like how you got successful, but I want to know what did you struggle with, especially at the beginning of your business? What were the things that you really, that you found really, really difficult and what advice do you have for other people who are also going through the same thing or thinking about starting their business? So, so if you want to bring more humanness or more realness to the, to your business, career or to your business, or maybe you're struggling in business and want some some inspiration to keep going or to get started, then I highly recommend you keep listening. All right, let's get into it. Here's Jason. You are the founder of the No BS Conference, yep. where I know the focus for you, I mean, for the speakers is to share real stories. Mm-hmm. And I personally, as a business owner, know how important it is to hear real stories from successful people to that, that make it relevant to what I'm going through because yep. as you know we have all these ups and downs um, along the way mm-hmm. now you are you're you're the director of a very successful um, digital agency mm-hmm. how long have you been doing that for 
Oh, I'm probably in my 15th year. So 15th year. Uh, you know, bring out the internet when it first started. I, uh, I started back in those days. So I think I graduated in around 2003 or 2002. Um, freelance for a while, uh, worked at a, a number of little agencies and then yeah, just decided to do it alone. So how long after you graduated did you decide, I'm going to start my own business? Uh, I, it, it kind of evolved, as I said, like freelancing, uh, building a bit of a reputation, good portfolio, uh, knowing a lot of uh, business people and, and business owners. And it just snowballed from there. So I uh, quickly found myself not having time for another job. Yeah. And I was just uh, solely working on, on my own project. So yeah, from that point on, I kind of decided to, to give it a crack. And, you know, I was young at the time, young, naive and all the rest of it. But um, yeah, gave it a crack. And here I am in 2020. Uh, talking to you now on a podcast. Awesome, and we're done. Uh, <laughs> thanks for coming in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, all right. Like we're going to go a, into there's a, little, a, there's a lot of other stuff. A lot of stuff that happens yeah. along the way. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. So, what were you doing at the start? What was your area of specialty? So, I'm a creative by trade. Um, so, traditional graphic design, media. Uh, so, the tangible type of media. You know, your, your rock posters and business cards and all that sort of fun stuff. Um, and then, yeah, uh, brand identity and. Obviously, with the evolution of the internet and, and, and online stuff, uh, moved into the, the online world. So, became a you know, pretty exclusive sort of web designer uh, back then. Thought myself had a code, which, you know, there were no courses for at the time. So, mm. yeah, really old school and started in that manner um, yeah. and slowly built up, you know, the agency I have today. So, we're, I think, 12 strong today. But, uh, yeah, it took me a long time, a lot of hard yards, a lot of uh, earning very little money. Um uh, for a long period of time, but we, we finally got there and yeah, I'm here today. Tell me about those early days. What was it like getting started? Oh, it's very, very tough to be honest. I mean, as I mentioned, you know, my portfolio grew and, you know, I started gaining more and more clients. But just in those first days, I, I thought it was a really important thing to find an office space. Mm -hmm. uh, so not sit in my bedroom or you know garage and, and and start a business because yeah that's just not gonna not gonna motivate you to do too much sit around in your underwear all day or, or not have a shower um so yeah from from early days even when I couldn't really afford it I, I got my first office um you know bought all my right. first computer didn't have much as as far as savings or, or whatever were concerned but uh yeah sat myself in an office and started trying to go out win some business yeah and, and built it up that way how are you at creating clients back at the beginning? Oh, look, I, I can talk and, to relate to, uh, talk and relate to a lot of different people. So I find that I can relate to people fairly easily um, and, and not really do a hard sell, just be natural, be honest, um, very black and white and, uh, and, and go that way. So I've never re I'd, I'd rather forego working for somebody than, than do something that I'm not comfortable with or I'm not mm. comfortable with the person. Um, so even now our, our mantra at the agency is like, we do good work for good people. Um, if you're none of those things, then we'd rather not do work. So uh, you had that you. you had that mindset even at the very beginning. Pretty much, uh, even when you're desperate for work, you know, I'd I'd rather not work than work for somebody I don't like or just for the dollar. So uh, yeah, money is not really the motivating factor for me at all. Um, it's obviously success and um, success in the business and, and growing the business, but not necessarily with that financial you know carrot at the end. It's it's really trying to be successful at what we do and and what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, you hear the stat that, you know, most businesses that fail don't make it past their first couple, it, of, years, first couple of years. Mm. Yeah. What were the biggest things you learned in those first critical few years? I was very lucky that I was living at home with mum and dad at the time and being a good good Greek boy, they're not going to kick me out of home too early. <laughs> so uh, um, yeah, that was probably the most fortunate bit because I could really just try and focus on the business without having to worry too much about how I was, you know, eating or, mm. or you know, or where I was sleeping. So I could focus on that and, like I said, earn very little initially, um, you know, probably not doing the right things or charging like I should or, or doing way too much work, um, but just trying to do all those hard yards initially to, to build up that clientele, that reputation. Um, yeah, you know, within well, – it, it took a good three, four years to, to sort of get to that point and it, it came about maybe 2007 or 2008. Um, yeah, I finally bit the bullet and employed my first staff member which again, I didn't think I could afford, but you know, threw myself in that sort of deep end and, and yeah. put that pressure on myself to, to basically say, look, I've got to earn more money or to bring in more sales and, and get this work done because there's only so much you can do on your own or, or you know, even working with contractors, 
you know, it's, it's a really tricky space too because if you've got freelancers or contractors working for you, you're at their sort of mercy. Um, mm. You know, they'll break deadlines, they'll decide to go on a fishing trip or, or something like that and leave you in the lurch. And um, yeah, there's something to be said for having a team in-house or at least, you know, your own full-time members to, to, to get the work done for you. So I did that. and So how many years in was that when you <sighs> hired your first full-timer? Probably five, five or six years. Five six years, years in, yeah. yeah. So what was the... Like what was the mindset struggle that you had at the time when it came to that? Because I know, because, you know, I've hired a Mm full-time assistant and that was a very big decision for me because there's that fear of will I have enough money coming in to support this person? What was going on for you? Yeah, so very similar. I didn't think I could afford it. didn't think I could do it. What happens if I can't pay these guys? Um, Obviously being self-employed and doing it quite hard. Um, willing not to really pay myself or, or take any money home and just to just to keep the staff members there. Um, but it was the best thing I did. Mm. Um, you know, I could bring in more work, we could turn over more work, um, and within six months I had my second staff member. So, you know, wow. we, were, we were a team of three pretty quickly. Got to around four or five of us within a couple of years um, and now we're at, yeah, we're at 12. So, yeah, yeah. Trying, to, trying to keep it around that mark. It's a, it's a nice balance. I think it's a nice number and manageable. That's a big team. Yeah. yeah, it's decent. It's decent. Like I've 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 heard that, you know, finding good people is one of the hardest things, be, and retaining them as well. That'd be the hardest thing in this this industry, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we've been through a lot of ups and downs, a lot of issues, staff probably being some of them, uh, or or the main ones. Um, yeah, like I said, one staff member decides to leave, leaves a really big hole in a small small business. So replacing those guys is is very hard. Um, or you can replace them, but you'll just keep turning them over until you find the right one. So mm. yeah, we've been in positions before where yeah, we, we know the person's not quite right, um, but we've almost uh, just conceded that it's better to have somebody at half capacity than go through the rigmarole of employing, finding another person. All right, well, it's, yeah. a, it's a six-month process, really. Um, you, know, you get somebody in, interview them, train them up. There's three, four months gone right there, and you, know, you can quickly find out that they're not the right person, but to then go and have to do that again. You've got deadlines, work coming in. It's it's very tricky. So that's probably been one of the, the toughest things, mm. finding the right people and and then holding on to them. Um, we were lucky initially in the first few years, had a bit of a, you know, a couple of, uh, couple of tricky years there with a few people obviously growing and, you know, they're trying to further their careers and what have you. And, and being a small business, a small business owner, there's not necessarily a – senior lead director or, you know, developer director or, or something like that for them to go to. So oh, so they're looking to advance correct. and move up yeah. sort of in a more corporate hierarchical structure? Correct. Um, and it's very hard in a small business. I mean, I'm the creative director. So who's no going to take-, gonna go, no <laughs> gonna take your spot? <laughs> who's going who's gonna to take my job? So, uh, yeah, so it, it's been okay. Now we're, things are going great. We've got a great team and everyone is, is on board with, you know, our beliefs and, mm. and what we're trying to achieve. So it's good. So how many years in were you before you moved out of mum and dad's? I was probably just around my, when my second staff member started. Okay, so yeah. about five years in. Yeah, so 2008, 2009. Yeah, yeah. 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 Look, I think it's important to, to, to note this because, you know, at the very beginning, the financials are the most stressful thing. Well, I, mean, I was newly engaged, trying to save for a house, all that mm. sort of stuff. So living with mum and dad was great. In that regard, that you know, it allowed me to do that. Was earning a lot of money at the time, and um, yeah, it allowed me to save and, and sort of progress the business as well as save for a place and, and move out and get married and do all those yeah. things. I remember when I started my business, I I house sat for like nine months. Yeah, I was at different places though, so I was moving Move around. around. I was six weeks here, three weeks there. Oh, someone's going to Europe for six weeks and need someone to take over their place for, you know, half rent or something. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah I'll do sure. that. Yeah. And I did that for about nine months and that worked really well for me and saved heaps of money mm. while I wasn't earning very much. Yep. What uh, – because I know that um, sometimes when you do have that safety net, mm-hmm. for example, like staying with mum and dad, yep. was there that – the temptation to maybe stay a little bit longer and continue to save more – or were you really had, like, no, nah, no, nah, I want to get out? I had done my dash by then. I think it's uh, <laughs> you know, poor guys. I need to give them a break as well. So, no, it was it, look, it was definitely the best thing that, that I did and that yeah. we did. But it was the right time. So, yeah, I was I was fortunate in that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had friends who were trying to do similar things to me, but 
physically, financially couldn't do it or, you know, their parents lived elsewhere or they had to move out of home for some particular reason. You're starting from zero and from scratch is very hard if you've got to try and maintain a, a life um, without any financial support or, or help. So I often say that to, to people that, that either work for us or I speak to. Yeah, great having aspirations to work for yourself. But if you already come from a professional background, you're used to a certain lifestyle, you're earning your 100 grand a year or whatever you're doing, to be prepared to earn zero, um, I don't think there's many people that can do that because everyone is used to a certain lifestyle and mm. when that's sort of stripped or taken away from you, it's uh, it's something very difficult to do. 100%. Agreed. So either buy into a business, an existing business, or, uh, or yeah, I w- I'd shy away from possibly doing it on your own unless yeah. you've got a good partner. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I must say even, I mean, because I'm five years now into business mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm used to not having that steady income yep. because – with, with, when you're on your own business, sometimes you have a, a massive month, sometimes you have a very low month, sometimes it's average, mm-hmm. but you don't have that consistency of the paycheck. Like you don't know, oh, I'm getting this much per month. And that is still, I find, difficult yep. to deal with. I used to let my my happiness yep. follow my bank balance. So if I had a good month, I'd be really happy. Yep. If I had a bad month, I'd get really depressed. And And my business coach told me she was like you can't you can't allow that to happen yeah one thing I did from very young uh, pretty much from when I first started was just giving myself a weekly salary wage yeah mi- as minimal as it was but just giving myself that discipline so no matter if I had a, a great week and you know 10 grand came in the door I wouldn't take the 10 grand home I'd just still pay myself that real minimum low wage and just keep that money in the business and it would allow me to do things or expand or you know, um, yeah. so I had that discipline from from very young. Where do you get that from? From my dad, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. What was, what's he like? Um, oh, he's. You know, well, they call me. You know, he's he's junior. So uh, we're very much the same. But as far as finance and managing money and all that sort of stuff's concerned, uh, I'm actually really interested in economics and and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I take a, an interest in that and try and do things within my means and uh, yeah, try not to live out of your means. I mean, that's uh, that's another key. A key thing um, mm. that people can can do very easily, especially when you're used to, like you said, living a certain way. Yeah. Um, I think if you heard that, by the way, there were some dogs in the meeting room next to us. It's a big dog too. <laughs> at our co work at my co work space here, there's a few little uh, little dogs running around. Something that you're doing that I find quite remarkable yep. is that you founded a conference. Yeah. Now, having, I mean, I threw a festival last year for my wedding and that was a very small event compared to what you're doing. And Mm -hmm. even that blew my mind with how much work was involved. So I'm very impressed that you've gone ahead and and, um, started your own conference and it's called No BS. Can you explain the idea behind the conference and how it came about? So for me, being obviously wearing many hats, being a creative, but also being a business owner, salesperson, you know, what have you, um, I would attend a lot of conferences, spend a lot of money, travel the world, and I'd often sit there for, you know, two days and at the end of it walk out and say, you know, what the hell was I doing here? Uh, why did I attend? Mm. You'd maybe take one talk out of 30 or take something, you know, uh, out of that. So I found that these events or these conferences, the, the content just wasn't there for me. Um, if I was just a designer at another agency and didn't have any other worries in the world or have to worry about the money coming in or... or creating a product and how do we market it or how do we do these types of things then yeah you know that'd be great you'd get some practical learnings but for somebody who wears so many different hats it's very hard to find that content and motivation and inspiration I suppose even validation um, for this crazy sort of journey that we're on um, because it does take takes a lot to to stick at this game for a long time or even in business in general but uh, stick at it without you know wanting to bang your head against the wall and you know, wonder is everyone else feeling the same as what I am, and you know, quite honestly, that most of them are. Um, so yeah, so I've had no BS in my brain for probably two years, yeah. Um, and yeah, no BS is no bullshit. Um, that's what it stands for, and it's just really about giving real world, real life learnings, journeys, experiences. Not so much the practical sort of techniques, but um, yeah, just giving a real honest view, uh, view and account mm. uh, to to the punters, I suppose, and, and what they're doing and what we can do to can, be better. Can you give me an example of what something that you were struggling with, especially maybe in the more recent, you know, in the more recent years, when even though you're really established, mm-hmm. there's still stuff that 
the stuff that always goes on f- yeah. for us as business owners. Um, what what is something that you wish you would you know you could learn about or um, or see other biz- other successful people sharing? I think we love hearing about startups and all these, you know, success stories. Uh, you know, the reality is that companies like Google and, and what have you have been around for 30 years. Uh, nobody knows that. Um, we see products being launched, big teams behind them, big budgets. Yeah, they all, yeah, but how do they get their money? How do they fund it? Mm-hmm. How do you market this thing? How do you manage your team? How do you grow your team? So all these sort of uh, pains and, and, and growing pains that a company has, I suppose, is what I, I wanted to know. Um, or, you know, when things are going bad, cash flow is tough and, and all that sort of stuff. That's all the, you know, what you find out very quickly in business and working for yourself, but you don't hear necessarily from your peers or, you know, uh, yeah, people you kind of look up to and aspire to. Uh, why, and people, they, why do people not share that, do you think? Probably scared. Um, don't want to look like they're struggling or, or failing or... I think people are very afraid to be vulnerable. Yeah. They'd be like, hey, I'm struggling. And especially if you're... You know, because people want to work with a company that is doing well. Like Correct. if you hear that a company is not doing well, you're like, oh, well, clearly they're not very good as a company. That's mm-hmm. the that's what comes yep. out, right? Um, or if you're, say, a business coach, it's like you can't tell people that you're struggling because you're supposed to be helping people with that's right. with um, their businesses. You know, I read I read Shoe Dog mm-hmm. by Phil Knight, the Nike founder, yeah. and I was amazed because you think, oh, Nike, this huge successful company, one of the most successful ever, and for the first 10 years of, of Nike, before it was even Nike, but for the first 10 years, he was on the verge of bankruptcy, yep. like the whole time. He was basically flying by the seat of his pants mm-hmm. and, and constantly pushing more money into the business and, yep. and spending more on, on stock. But I was like – but his his complete passion and vision for the business was enough to get it through maybe a little bit of luck, I don't know, but he. There's luck definitely involved <laughs> in everything. Um, look, even the conference like we're like we're talking about, um, it's a really big undertaking. I didn't realise how big. I believe in it that much that you know it's self-funded and um, you know while we've knocked on doors of sponsors and all that sort of stuff, it's just something I really wanted to do. And thank God I've got a great business partner in in Marco that um, that sort of backed me and supported me and and said, yeah, let's do this. And you know we really need to change the way our conferences are, or our digital conferences in Australia in particular, um, and give people just great content, good people. Uh, let's not blur the lines too much. Let, let's not have five, six stages and, you know, um, we're, we're, doing a single, mm. we're doing a single track. Uh, we're bringing in some great speakers from, you know, all around the world. So we've got... From think, what, what companies? Uh, so we've got Eric Snowden from Adobe, so the, I suppose, creative director of Adobe. We have Matthias Correa from the co-founder of Behance, um, we have Lissandra uh, Falaire from Nike. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of these amazing people from amazing companies, but their background is is fantastic. So Matthias, for instance, who founded um, Behance, had a small agency in Spain, came up with the idea of Behance and pretty much shut the doors and just focused on it, ate noodles and you know bread and water for a long period of time. And it took him about 13 years before Adobe ended up coming in and, and mm. purchasing it for, you know, a handsome sum but we see the end result yeah what happened before that that's what i'm sort of interested in and that's what i you know want a lot of our speakers to to get across to people um and and yeah so there's a lot of those types of stories out there so how are you how are you briefing them just to be honest and as real and as raw as possible um yeah let down any barriers just uh yeah tell us as much as you can tell us your journey or if you're going to talk to us about what you're doing, just be be really honest, candid, and and don't sugarcoat things. I suppose is what uh, what yeah. I want out of it. Yeah. What if they have the fear? Uh, we'll, we'll try and break it out of them. I well, suppose. they would have said yes, I guess. <laughs> yeah, correct. I mean, look, a lot of them saw the brief and you know, they love the concept. And I suppose, you know, while we're trying to make this event not corporate, all the ticket sales have been to corporates, mm-hmm. um, which I find really interesting because there's definitely a gap in the market for this type of content. I think. Um, and what we're trying to achieve and do. And I'm effectively creating an event that I want to go to, um, as silly as it may sound. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, the, and, and like I said, ticket sales have been great. We're, we're bringing on a whole bunch of teams are buying tickets. So, you know, four to six, ten people yeah. uh, coming from from individual companies and, and large multinational companies that I never thought would even, you know, sort of be interested in our little event. Well, I think um, corporates are beginning to see how important it is to bring more of that human, I think so, that vulnerability mm. to the workplace. Yeah, 
Um, cause I think for so long now, I mean, when I work with clients, a lot of them come to me, a lot of them are from corporate mm. and they'll say to me, I'll say, what do you want to improve in? What, you know, what do you want to do? And they'll say, I've, I've been told I need to bring more humanness and more yeah. personality to mm-hmm. the workplace. How can I tell more stories? How can I be more, you know, just bring more of me? You know, that's what they're asking for help with. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, there's, there's definitely that out there. Um, and just honesty, um, I think is a, is a key to, to most things. Um, and just be real with people because shit's not easy. It's it, life's mm. difficult, work's difficult, and you know if we can all learn from each other, then 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 fantastic. And that's Absolutely. that's what I I think was the gap for me. I just wasn't getting that as someone who was self employed, trying to build a business. Well, how do I do this? How do I do that? How did this guy, you know, navigate these issues? Whether it be staff or whether it be cash flow or yeah. you know even finding new clients. I mean, let's talk about that. You know, and and the more in depth I get with these speakers or, or other people I meet from large agencies or what have you, they have the same pains that we do. You know, they have the cash flow issues. They have, you know, be, not being able to bring in a certain amount of leads or work. Um, something I never thought that these guys went through, but they do. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess as you grow bigger, your problems change. Yeah. Like the problems you might have when you're a fledgling business, they you still have problems when you are yep. more advanced. I mean, you hear the problem of like businesses that grow too quickly Mm -hmm. you think oh my god they're doing so well but then it's like oh no but they don't have the right processes in place or they're hiring people non-stop and then their their cash flow completely and we've been been through that ourselves so again lessons learned um but you know we sort of fumbled our way through it because we didn't know any better um and if we potentially went to an event or a conference and heard these types of <laughs> types of things, then uh, we maybe would have done things differently. Oh, if only no BS was around Correct. when you <laughs> when you so, were growing your business. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm sure that there will be plenty of learnings, and also um, something that I'm really excited as well is about meeting the attendees yeah. and the people are going because something that I you don't really plan for this. You you think, oh, I'm going to this conference for the content because mm. I want to learn stuff and, you know, meet meet people as well. But you primarily are attracted to the, the content. But yep. then what always amazes me is that I end up meeting great people yeah. and making great connections and, you know, learning so much from the attendees as well. Yeah. Well, if it wasn't for, you know, similar type of networking scenarios uh, at events that I've been to around the world, then this event wouldn't happen. I mean... Yeah. I wouldn't have built relationships with these great speakers who have then introduced me to other people and other speakers. And, you know, it's a it, it's an organic thing. You, you can't force, you know, friendships. You can't force working relationships. Um, it, it's got to be an organic thing. And, and, you know, ultimately, if you like somebody, you'll work with them and there'll be flow on effects from that. But if it comes from, a, I think, an honest, real place, yeah. um, then you'll have success in, in whatever you need to do, I think. But, uh, yeah, like I said, if it wasn't for those types of things, then no BS wouldn't exist. Yeah. And that's what I want my attendees or delegates, whatever we want to call them, uh, I want them to get out of it, um, get those real life learnings. But yeah, let's let's meet people, let's connect with people and, you know, share our stories, I suppose. Yeah, I love yeah. it. Now, for someone who is starting their, their own business or maybe they have been in business for a while mm-hmm. and they are struggling, mm-hmm. they're thinking, oh, I don't know if I can do this, it's just, it's just overwhelming or there's just too many issues to deal with, what, um, what couple of pieces of advice would you give them? Ask questions. Um, seek out the people that you want to find out things from. Um, so people in similar situations, even people in, in, in higher positions, but obviously people who have gone through things. So ask questions. That's one thing that I was probably pretty shitty at, to be honest. Um, so like finding up so, mentors? Or? Yeah, um, or finding mentors or, or just bouncing your ideas and thoughts off people because it can be really lonely uh, being self-employed, uh, being an entrepreneur or whatever. <laughs> Um, it can be quite lonely and there's, you know, not many things or, or not many people you can talk to. And again, pride comes into it as well. I mean, you don't want to let people know you're struggling or you're finding things tough. Uh, I think these days is a lot better, especially, you know, social media and, and what have you and, and meetups and, and all that sort of stuff. But back in my day when I started, none of those existed. So, um, yeah, definitely get it, get into, into the meetup scene, seek out people, connect with them on LinkedIn or ask questions. Just, um, yeah, that, that's probably my, my main advice. Yeah. Yeah. And um, second piece of advice? Build some thick skin. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, try not to take everything personally like we can. I mean... Can you give an example of a time when you did and how you learned that? It probably happens daily for me. Uh, being a creative, being a designer, you very, you don't really like a... Well, we call it constructive criticism, but uh, anyone criticising anything you do is, uh, <laughs> is a big no-no. So, yeah, you've, you've definitely got to be able to take that on board, keep your mouth shut, 
build some, some thick skin and, and take it for what it is and, and learn from it, grow from it. Wonderful. Mm. Awesome. Well, Jason, this has been awesome having you on the show and thank you for sharing a bit of your story. No worries. If people want to connect with you or learn more about No BS, mm-hmm. where can they go? Uh, so the, the conference website's nobs.events. Um, so you can jump on there, find out a little bit more, see the great lineup of speakers we've got coming, buy, buy your tickets. Uh, we've just released uh, you know, some freelance startup uh, sort of passes as well so we've had oh, a cool. yeah we've had a lot of people contacting us because you know conferences can be pricey and expensive mm-hmm. and they are expensive to put on but um you know we, we want this to be inclusive for everybody so we've released those passes um so go on there check it out and then yeah you can connect with me on on linkedin or, or social media just jason Sultan. Sure. uh give us a Give us a look up. I think it's also worth mentioning that NoBS is held at the Forum. What a venue. In Melbourne, which is just beautiful. Yeah. Even if you go to experience an event there, I think it's... Well, people who it. have been there, it's traditionally a music venue. Yeah. Um, it's one of uh, Melbourne's oldest theatres and they've just spent a, a hell of a lot of money refurbing it and, and what have you. And just to walk in there, if you don't feel inspired, um, mm. yeah, there's something wrong with you, I think. So, yeah, having a whole bunch of digital creative tech people in this space... Um, I think it's going to be great. And the after party is going to be even better because uh, we have a, a large music venue, obviously, to, to take advantage of. Yes, mm. yes. It's going to be like a huge rock concert, isn't it? Something like that, <laughs> I think, yeah. We're working we're working at the finer details now, but it's going to be quite cool. Brilliant. Well, I'm really looking forward to it, Jason, and all the best with it too. Thanks very much. A big thanks to Jason Sultan from Soul and Wolf and also No BS Conference for being such an awesome guest on the show this week and for sharing those stories. You can find out more about the conference at nobs.events or, and, and also connect with Jason on LinkedIn. And I'll put all of those links in the show notes at thecmethod.com slash 248. Check that link in the description of this podcast in your app. Now, remember to jump on the wait list for the C Method Academy if you want to develop your communication and your leadership skills, your speaking skills as well in a supportive environment. Did I mention you also get direct access to me because we do live webinars every month? Mm-hmm. That's definitely worth joining for. Go to thecmethod.com slash join to join the wait list. Thank you for so much for spending some time with me and I will talk to you next week. I'm Christina Cantors and this has been Stand Out, Get Noticed. Mm-hmm.